Indeed, to worship the Lord is the highest activity that man could do. And one of the best ways to worship the Lord is to enjoy the heritage of His church and to bring it steps further into human history. Ang pagpalaganap ng kaharian ng Diyos ang isa sa mga pinakamatatas na uri ng pagsamba. That's why it is important to study church history, not only to be informed, but also to learn lessons for today. At yan po ang patuloy natin gagawin sa pag-aaral ng Book of Acts, ang pamagat ng pag-aaral natin ngayon, Church Growth, Pains and Gains. Dahil ang paglago, ang paglaki, ay meron talagang mga kung minsan ay hirap na kasama, bagamat marami rin itong mga kasama ang mga benefit sa ating buhay. Salamat o Diyos dahil kayo ay patuloy na nagpapalaganap na inyong salita and you continue, Lord, to allow your church to grow, to minister to more and more people so that your kingdom will reign more and more in people's hearts. Right now, Father, we ask you to be our speaker. Continue to uh, teach us, enlighten us on the history of your church that your son Jesus founded. And we pray, Father, that we will find our correct positions, our correct activities and bearings and guidance coming from the history of your church. Father, guide us, be our speaker, be our teacher, lead us. In the name of Jesus, your Son, we pray. Amen. Kasama po si Cornelius, si, uh, sa ministry na ni Pedro, sa bahay ni Cornelius, who was not a Jew, but indeed a Roman soldier and officer, Peter pioneered soul winning among Gentiles. Sa pagsisimula po ng Kristyanismo, hindi inakala ng mga unang mana ng balataya na dadalhin nila ang pananalig maging sa mga hindi hudyo The revelation of this important truth was slow and not many people were able to pick it up immediately. We will be reading many conflicts that arise from this growth of the church from exclusively Jewish in orientation to that of a church for the whole world including the Gentiles. Acts 11, 1 to 3 from the contemporary English version. The apostles and the followers in Judea heard that Gentiles had accepted God's message. So when Peter came to Jerusalem, some of the Jewish followers started arguing with him. They wanted Gentile followers to be circumcised, and they said, you stayed in the homes of Gentiles and you even ate with them. May mga ginawa po si Pedro na hindi inaasahan na gagawin ng isang Hudyo. Na ganyan ay ginagawa niya bilang isang Kristiyano. At yon ay pumunta siya sa bahay ng isang hindi Hudyo, pumasok siya doon, kumain pa siya doon, at natulog pa siya doon ng ilang gabi. Hindi kasi nakikisalamuha ang mga Hudyo sa mga Gentiles to the point that they would enter their homes and eat with them. Sa kabila ng napakagandang balita na nakakilala ang mga Gentile people na ito sa Panginoon, tinanggap nila ang Panginoon, pati ang biyaya ng Espiritong Banal, na baliwala yun. Kasi ang malalaking issue ng mga Gentile Christians ay eh yung sabi nila kailangan circumcision first. All the men of Israel had been always in, circumcised at childhood. Pero kung may mga matatanda na ng mga lalaki na hindi Israelite at Gentile na ngayon ay maniniwala sa Panginoong Yesus, dapat gaya hindi nila yung ginawa natin. They should be circumcised first. But these were all adults. And the Spirit of God did not even require it. But now the people, the believers, were requiring it. And they were making a big issue out of Peter. Sabi nila, you had fellowship with Gentiles? How can you ever dare to do that? At nagtalo-talo sila. Just like the Pharisees, na minaliit yung mga miracles, at ang minalaki eh, bakit nag-miracle during Sabbath? Ngayon, itong mga unang Kristiyano, minamaliit nila na ang mga hindi Israelita ay tumanggap na rin kay Jesus, at ang minamalaki nila eh, hindi sila Israelite, hindi sila circumcised, hindi tayo dapat makisalamuha sa kanila, yun ang naging issue. There was the small thing over the big thing. Lesson for us immediately is to focus on the big thing. Laging may malaki at may maliit na issues, huwag nating mamaliitin yung malaki at mamalakihin yung maliit. Avoid smallness of mind. Madalas sa mga pag-aaway natin, kahit hindi sa mga bagay na religyoso, is because of the smallness of mind. Sabi nga nila, in the absence of big things, small things become big to small minds. Pag maliit ang iyong utak, minamalaki mo yung maliit. Kasi maliit lang pala yung kasya sa utak mo, puno na tuloy agad. 
Kaya dapat pinapalaki natin ang ating isip, dinadamihan ng kasya, pinapalawak ang mga kaalaman, pinapalawak natin ang ating vocabulary so we can understand more terminologies and we understand more ideas behind those terminologies. Habang ang tao ay nabubuhay, tungkulin niya sa kanyang sarili at sa kanyang manlilikha na palawakin ang kanyang isip. Yung dating makitid, lumalawak dapat, hindi baligtad. And what is important in life, so that we don't always quarrel about little things, is to have a big mission, a big cause, a big goal and objective, a big mind, a big idea, a big reason. Halimbawa, what's big in the church? Soul winning. To win souls for the Lord. What is big? To edify those souls that are one. Para sila lumago at maging more and more like Christ. Yun ang big. Ano yung small? Naiinis ako sa isang sister. Ano yung small? Sino ang gagamit ng church vehicle? Youth ba o yung mga adults? Ano yung small? Ano bang isusuot ko papunta sa church? Mga small things. Pero pagka hindi mo na laging naalala ko ano yung big, lumalaki yung small. Sa pamilya, ano yung big? Na kayo ay magibigan, magmahalan, magtulungan. Ano yung small? na naiinis ako sa asawa ko, malakas maghilik. Ano yung small, na hindi ko gusto ang templa ng asawa ko sa sinigang, matabang? Small yun. Ano yung small, gusto ko ganito kalamig yung aircon, gusto niya ganun kainit? Small. Pero marami mga tao, nag-aaway-aaway, naghihiwahiwalay dahil sa small things. Nalilimutan nila kasi kung ano yung big. There's a big thing. The higher things that we live for. In life, in your career, In your relationship, in your year and month and week and day, kailangan alam natin kung ano yung big. Sa araw na to, ano yung big? I will worship. So ano yung small? May lalaban pa ako, may gagawin pa ako, tinatamad ako, inaantok ako. Small yun. Sa isang linggo, ano ang buwan nyo ng inyong buhay? Sa isang buwan ng inyong buhay, ano yung big? Therefore, you can sacrifice the small hindi lahat malaki. Merong maliit. At hindi dapat yun malakihin. Acts 11, to 7 Then Peter told them exactly what had happened. Then Peter goes on to tell them, I was in the town of Joppa and was praying when I fell sound asleep and had a vision. I saw heaven open and something like a huge sheet held by its four corners came down to me. When I looked in it, I saw animals, wild beasts, Snakes and birds. I heard a voice saying to me, "Peter, get up, kill this, and eat them." So, habang si Pedro ay natutulog ay nagkaroon siya ng pangitain galing sa langit, tinig mula sa langit, at mayroong parang malaking malaking kumot na bumababa mula sa langit na may mga nakasakay doon na kung ano anong mga uri ng hayop na hindi kinakain ng mga Israelites. They were considered unclean. At sabi nung boses, o katayin mo sila, linisin mo, lutuin mo, kainin mo. Siyempre, hindi gagawin ni Pedro yon dahil siya isang hudyo. Acts 11.8 But I said, Lord, I can't do that. I've never eaten a bite of anything that is unclean and not fit to eat. So here is Peter, a traditional Jew, created man arguing with his creator due to religious belief and conditioning. Kung si Pedro nakikipagtalo sa Diyos tungkol sa kanya mga tradisyonal na paniniwala, ang mga tao ganun din sa isa't isa, kotakot-takot na pagtatalo ang ginagawa. And Peter was actually saying to the rest of his listeners, kung maselan kayo ako din, nagkaroon na ako ng pangitain mula sa langit mismo. Eh. Pinapakain ako ng mga hindi kinakain natin mga Israelites. Tinanggihan ko. Acts 11:9 to 10 The voice from heaven spoke to me again. When God says that something can be used for food, don't say it isn't fit to eat. This happened to me three times before it was all taken back into heaven. So magot ngayon ang tinig ng Diyos mo na sa langit. Kung anong ipinapakain sa'yo ng Diyos kainin mo, malinis yun. Huwag mong tatawagin marumi, ang ngayon ay minamalinis ng Diyos, pinalilinis, para kainin mo. So here is God's word over tradition, over dietary laws, and over religious teaching. What will you do when what you've always believed in your life 
When you took the tradition, you have always practiced. The diet you had always observed. The religious teaching that you have so meticulously followed is now being challenged by heaven itself. At sabi ng tinig mula sa langit, kalimutan mo na yung mga dati mong alam, yung dati mong tradisyon, yung mga dating turo, nasa scripture pa man din yung iba dyan, sinasabi ko na nga sa'yo, malinis na yan, kainin mo na. For the longest time, Jews regarded the religious teachings as God's unchanging command. Daang taon, libo pa nga, na sobrang seryoso ang mga Israelita sa nakasulat sa kanilang mga aklat at iniisip nilang yun ay hindi magbabago kailanman dahil lutos yun ng Diyos. After all, those regulations were really included in their holy scriptures. Pagkatapos biglang magkakaroon ka ng vision from God, naiibahin yun. Mabuti sana kung sabay-sabay lahat ng mga mana ng palatayan ng vision para pag may sumunod doon sa bagong vision, hindi siya mapagalitan ng mga old-timers at mga makatradisyon. Pag nakarinig ka ng ganong teaching na sa iyong kaugalian, sa iyong old scriptures, bawal, tapos ngayon ipinapagawa, what are the possibilities that you could think of? That the old teaching was God's idea, but now God changes His mind. That's a possibility. But how will you be able to confirm that indeed God is changing His mind? Eh, meron kang written scripture na sinasabing, huwag kainin yun. How would believers know when God changed His mind about something? That was hard. Or another possibility about this old idea that is now being changed, that God is not really changing His mind. But those old teachings were not really His. Mas mahirap naman tanggapin yun. So yung isa, turo talaga yan ng Diyos, pero may bago ng turo, so kalimutan mo yung luma. Parang mahirap tanggapin, dahil sanay ka sa luma. Pwede mo namang isipin, siguro yung luma, hindi naman talaga ideya ng Diyos. At itong bago, ang talagang ideya niya. E ang sakit ding tanggapin yun, dahil ang tagal-tagal mo nang sumusunod ng luma. Tapos, hindi kaya galing yun sa Diyos? It was an unsettling idea, but not impossible. How would believers know which religious doctrine or practice is really from God? And how, how many of those, or which of those, are only from religious leaders that they say are the words of God? So may isa na namang possibility that those teachings were His, but God changes commands depending on the needs of the times. And apparently, this is the best choice we have. Na yung mga sinauna, dati mga katuroan sa Israel, ay talaga namang galing sa Diyos. Pero ngayon, nagbabago na ang panahon, dumating na ang Mesiyas, dumating na ang tagapagligtas, marami nang dapat baguhin para mag-adjust sa katotohanan na yun. Kaya ngayon, ipinapakain na kay Pedro ang mga dating bawal kainin. Kasi actually, hindi naman yung pagkain ng tunay na topic. Tatanggalin na ang division between Jews and Gentiles. Yung naghihiwalay sa kanila na pagtutuli or circumcision, buburahin na. Kaya kahit uncircumcised men can become believers. Yung naghihiwalay sa kanila na, na, na dietary laws, na naghihiwalay sa kanilang, hindi kami kumakain yan, gentle lang kumakain yan. Ngayon ipinapakain kay Peter, ibig sabihin binubura na yung bakod. Yun kaya ang gustong palabasin ng Diyos. Tayo kasi ngayon, tinitingnan na lang natin yung nakaraan, alam na natin yung sagot. Pero nung nagaganap yun at that present time, it was difficult for them to know. How would believers adjust to changing times? There could be many challenges in applying old Jewish or even Christian tradition to one's present situation. At ang tanong pa ng iba, kung nun pong panahon ni Pedro na daang taon na sinusunod nila yung nakasulat nilang scriptures, tapos magkakaroon siya ng vision na iniiba na yon, ina-adjust. Ngayon po kayang libong taon na na nasulat yung scripture sa mga New Testament, meron din po kayang mga bagong leading ang Holy Spirit? O may mga katuruan kaya doon na pang panahon lang nila noon at hindi na para sa panahon natin ngayon, isa na naman yung challenge sa tunay na maghahanap ng katotohanan. At the most, what you do is not to be permanently fixed on anything but be ready for further enlightenment, further instruction, and guidance from the Holy Spirit. 
Nakita po natin sa buong kasaysayan ng Old and New Testament, may mga kaugalian, may mga katuroan na naiiba pagdating ng panahon. Hindi naiiba yung diwa, ang diwa lang naman ay turuan ng tao and guide people unto godliness. Teach them to be free from needless imprisonment, from needless suffering, and teach them how to be better persons, how to be good followers of God, and good fellow men. Yun ang hindi naiiba. Ang naiiba lang kung isan yung detail how to do it. So for the longest time, the faith was exclusive to the Jews. They were not doing missions. Kanila lang yun. Ngayon, biglang sinabi ni Lord, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. And now, Peter was being given this vision. Anong gagawin nila sa ganung mga pagbabago? So ikinukwento ni Pedro na katatapos pa lang nila mag-usap ng Diyos sa vision na kainin mo na yung mga dapat kainin, ibig sabihin tanggalin mo na yung mga kaartehan mo na Jewish, tanggalin mo na yung mga bakod sa iyong utak na hiwalay kayo sa mga Gentiles, ipinagpatuloy niya ang kwento. Acts 11, 11 to 14. Suddenly, three men from Caesarea stood in front of the house where I was staying. The Holy Spirit told me to go with them and not to worry. Then six of the Lord's followers went with me to the home of a man who told us that an angel had appeared to him. The angel had ordered him to send to Joppa for someone named Simon Peter. Then Peter would tell him how he and everyone in his house could be saved. A very interesting story. Sa pagpapatuloy ni Pedro, matapos kong makita yung pangitain at madinig ang tinig ng Diyos sa pinapakain ako ng mga dating bawal, nagising naman ako at suddenly meron namang tatlong, kung baga tatlong beses na ulit yung vision niya, ngayon may tatlong lalaki na galing sa Caesarea from the house of Cornelius, the Roman officer, the Gentile. At sabi daw nung tatlong ng Holy Spirit sa kanya, huwag ka mag-alala. Sumama ka, susunduin ka nila, pinapatawag ka nila ng amo nila na sa Cornelius dahil may anghel na nagpakita kay Cornelius at sinabi, ipasundo ka para maipaliwanag po sa kanila ang salvation in the name of Jesus. Siyempre, mag-aalala si Pedro dahil kanina, pinapakain siya na hindi dapat kainin. Ngayon naman, pupunta sa bahay ng isang Gentile at tuturuan niya tungkol kay Jesus na for the first time, bakit kami magtuturo sa mga Gentile? Hindi naman sila kasama sa aming pananalig. In other words, yung pangitain tungkol sa pagkain ay isang metaphor o talinghaga para sa tunay na ipapagawa sa kanya. Makihalubilo, makiisa, magturo, makipagkapatiran sa mga Gentiles. So three men, for three repeats of the same vision, equal, no? And now, this is the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit told me to go with them and not to worry. Why worry? Because what the Holy Spirit was asking them to do was against the written Old Testament scriptures. Nakakalito talaga yun. Kaya ang mayroong pang idiniin, huwag ka mag-alala. Ang ipapagawa sa iyo ng Diyos ngayon ay isang bagay na hindi pa nagagawa before. At sa katunayan, babasamain ng iba at babasahin nila na pagsalungat doon sa nakasulat na scriptures. But how can you argue with the Holy Spirit? When the Holy Spirit and the voice of God in heaven tells you, go and teach about my son, Jesus Christ. So may anim na mga sumama sa kanya who were going to be witnesses, of course, to what would happen. Pumunta ang Pedro sa bahay ni Cornelius ayon sa kanyang kwento. Ikinukwento na lang niya to, ha sa mga na naninita sa kanya. Acts 11, 15-17 After I started speaking, the Holy Spirit was given to them just as the Spirit had been given to us at the beginning. I remember that the Lord had said, John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. God gave those Gentiles the same gift He gave us when we put our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. So, how could I have gone against God? Alam niyo ba na pagpunta ko doon sa bahay na yon na hindi ko naman dapat puntahan at ayaw ko naman puntahan sana at sinunod ko lang yung urging ng Holy Spirit, tumanggap sila sa Panginoon at pagtanggap nila kay Jesus, binabaan din sila ng Espiritong Banal and they also spoke in tongues like we did at the day of Pentecost. Ngayon, sabihin mo sa akin na hindi ako dapat pumunta doon. 
Sabi ni Pedro. Yung espiritong bumaba sa atin, bumaba rin sa kanila. Si Jesus na tinanggap natin, tinanggap din nila. So, paanong maaaring mangyari na ang ginawa ko ay labag sa kalooban ng Diyos? Bagamat labag sa nakasulat at labag sa ating mga kaugalian. So, ibig sabihin sa kanilang spiritual growth, merong pain saying goodbye from traditions that are now superseded by new commands. Meron kang dapat bitawan kasi dapat ang kamay mo maging malaya para humahawak ng bagong mga katuruan. May pagbabago. At ang kinahirap nito, walang nauna sa kanila. Sila yung nauuna sa oras na yon, sila yung pioneer, nangangapa sila, pero sabi nila, how can we argue against this overwhelming evidence that it is God's will, though it is against our traditions? The same gift of the Holy Spirit was given to the Gentiles, leveling, and this was an equalization. Sabi, tumigil na tayo mag-isip-isip na mas blessed tayo kaysa sa Gentiles. Yung ibinigay na gift sa atin, binigay din sa kanila, tabla na. There was a removal of boundaries. And the command, the confirmation, the blessing was clearly from God. Though not in agreement with tradition or the Old Testament. Acts 11.18 When they heard Peter say this, they stopped arguing and started praising God. They said, God has now let Gentiles turn to Him and He has given life to them. Sa wakas, naliwanagan sila. Tumigil na silang magreklamo at nagsimula silang magpuri sa Diyos. Happily, reason prevails. The conservatives open their minds and their hearts and argumentation turns into praise. Lesson para sa atin ngayon, mga kapatid, address disagreement and misunderstanding with a clear and clean explanation. Kung may mga hidwaan, mga di pagkakaunawaan, ipaliwanag ng mabuti. Yun naman pinagpapaliwanagan, huminahon, tumahimik, at makinig. Huwag magsabay, magsalita. At nangibabaw ang katwiran. Acts 11.19 Some of the Lord's followers had been scattered because of the terrible trouble that started when Stephen was killed. They went as far as Phoenicia, Cyprus, and Antioch, but they told the message only to the Jews. So as you will see, the message spread even beyond the boundaries of Israel, and it has gone to many places. But for that time, the people were only spreading the good news about Jesus to fellow Jews. Wala pa rin sumunod kay Peter na nagpunta siya sa Gentile. The others also played it safe. They were telling people outside of Israel, but only to the Jews who were living there. You know, persecution from Jewish authorities compelled many people to leave Judea and find safer places. Why? Because Jesus as Messiah was considered blasphemous, unofficial, and unlawful. Para tawagin mo si Jesus na, Son of God, King of kings, Lord of lords, was a challenge to the Roman Empire. And the Roman Empire took it personally. Kaya napakalaking risk na sabihin ng ganun mga bagay. Stephen was the first, and many believers fled to safety. Acts 11, 20-21 Some of the followers from Cyprus and Cyrene went to Antioch and started telling Gentiles the good news about the Lord Jesus. The Lord's power was with them, and many people turned to the Lord and put their faith in Him. Kung saan saan na nakarating, no? Ang mga katuroan tungkol kay Jesus hanggang nakarating sa Antioch, a very rich commercial city. At doon nagsimula na yung mga karaniwang mga manan ng palataya ay nagturo sa mga Gentiles. Ordinary believers from Jerusalem, following Peter's example and explanation, began teaching about Jesus to Gentiles. Kaya nakarating sa atin ang gospel. For all intents and purposes, Gentiles tayo, hindi naman tayo Israelites. Pero nakarating sa atin dahil inilabas nila from an exclusively Jewish Christian community, dinala nila sa Gentiles. 
Naturally, this would alarm Rome because the little domestic indigenous native faith in Israel was becoming international. It was crossing borders and now it has crossed borders between Jews only to the Gentiles. Anything that was becoming popular could be a major threat to the empire. At alam na alam naman natin na kaya lang naman nagahari ang Roma sa mga bansang ito dahil sa lakas ng kanilang mga humbo. Through the power of their sword, they were able to rule over these lands. But what do you do with a religion that's supposed to be starting small only locally now becomes international? What do you do as an empire when this religion believes in a savior who rose from the dead, who went to heaven, who is now king of kings, lord of lords, and who was killed precisely for the crime that he was being accused of, that he was the king of the Jews? We have already belabored why it was bothering. Because in Rome, there was a teaching that the emperor was God. When the emperor died, he is divinized and he goes to heaven. Of course, according to their story. So the emperor that sits on the throne is the son of God, the emperor who is now in heaven. And the emperor who sits on the throne is king over all the kings under the empire. And the king in Israel is the puppet king appointed by Rome. What do you do when Jesus believers say that Jesus is the Son of God, not the Emperor? That Jesus is the King of Kings, not the Emperor? That Jesus is the King of the Jews, not Herod, the appointed one of the Emperor? What do you do with a religion like that that is heading against the Empire in its belief? Kaya nagkaroon ng persecution. Kaya nililipol nila mga Kristiyano. Mga kapatid, gusto kong idiin nung first century para sabihin mong, I believe that Jesus is the Son of God, that Jesus is Lord, that He is Lord of Lords, King of Kings, that He is coming again. Para mo na sinabing, hindi ako naniniwala sa Rome. Hindi ako naniniwala sa Roman Empire and the Roman Emperor sitting there in the throne in Rome is a fake because there is a real King of Kings, there is a real Lord of Lords, there is a real Son of God. That's why the first generation believers up to the third century had to pay for their lives just to say, Jesus is Lord. Kaya sinasabi, but if you believe in your heart and confess with your lips, that God raised him from the dead, you are saved. Because it was such a great effort to say, I believe. The empire will kill you. And do not forget to thank God for the privilege of being free today to say Jesus is Lord without being afraid for your life. Many believers before us had to pay with their lives just to say that. And they said it loudly. At hanggang ngayon, mga kapatid, maraming lugar sa mundo na ang pananalig kay Kristo ay hindi lang pinagbabawal, kundi pinaparusahan pa, if not officially, at least in actual deed. May mga Kristiyano na pag nagwa-worship ngayon sa ibang part ng mundo, hinahagisan ng granada, binobomba. May mga Sunday school na sinusunog ang mga bata ng mga malulupit na mga tao doon hindi naniniwala kay Jesus. Hanggang ngayon, may persecution. Kaya huwag nating mamaliitin yung kaating kalayaang sumamba. Huwag nating mamaliitin na pwede tayong magtipon-tipon ng walang takot. Na pwede tayong umawit ng malakas. Na pwede tayong magturo sa ating mga katabi sa sasakyan, mga kapitbahay, na hindi tayong natatakot na kailangan tayong mamatay para dyan. Kaya naman lalo dapat tayong magsikap. Lalo tayong dapat magpursige na ipamalita ito. Dahil hindi naman natin kailangan magbayad ng katulad ng ibinabayad ng iba. Salvation is free, but it is not cheap. Jesus paid for it with His dear life. And many Christian martyrs before us, and even in our time now, still pay for it with their lives. Pahalagahan natin yun. 
So, Acts 11.22, sa pagpapatuloy. News of what was happening reached the church in Jerusalem. Then they sent Barnabas to Antioch. Antioch is a city in the present-day Syria. Barnabas means son of encouragement. At nung maalaman nilang lumalago ang gawain doon sa Antioch, ipinadala nila isa sa mga pinakamagagaling na mga teachers sa church, si Barnabas, to encourage the growing church. Lesson, fruitful work and fruitful workers should be supported. Agad-agad, the church in Jerusalem, the center, sent somebody to encourage the workers in Antioch. Acts 11, 23-24 When Barnabas got there and saw what, God had, saw what God had been kind enough to do for them, he was very glad. So he begged them to remain faithful to the Lord with all their hearts. Barnabas was a good man of great faith. And he was filled with the Holy Spirit. Many people turned to the Lord. So the church was growing. And the growth was fueled by dedicated, spirit-filled, excellent leaders. Napakalaking pananagutan na mamuno, malaki man o malitang yung grupo, dahil maraming pagpapala ang naibubuhos sa isang grupo kung yung leader nila spirit-filled, masipag at mahusay. Acts 11, 25-26 Barnabas went to Tarsus to look for Saul. Kung naalala bigla ang kwento tungkol kay Saul, what do we remember about Saul? Saul was a persecutor. When he was going to Damascus to arrest Christians, Jesus spoke to him and he was blinded. But after three days of fasting and praying, the Lord gave back his sight to him and he became a believer. Then he became a teacher. But what do we see? Masyado siyang naglalagalbab sa apoy ng kanyang pananalig na natutupok, nasusunog ang lahat ng katabi niya, nasusunog siya sa karaming bulo. Kutakot-takot na away ang nasuong nitong si Saul at doon sa Damascus na nagtuturo sana siya, pinagtangkaan siyang patay ng mga tao dahil na offense sa kanya. So yung mga nananalig sa kanyang sinasabi at naging mga followers niya, lihim siyang isinakay sa malaking basket, pinadaus-dus mula doon sa mataas na pader ng lungsod at pinatakas. Nakarating siya sa Jerusalem, ayaw siyang paniwalaan ng mga kapatiran doon dahil nga hindi naman siya kasama nung simula at siya nga ay nagpapapatay sa mga Kristiyano. Pero siya ay sinuportahan itong si Barnabas. Sinabi, nabalitaan ko rin ang mga trabaho niya, nakita ko, so tanggapin na natin siya, nakapatid natin, etc., etc. At nagsimula na naman yung Paul na magturo na magturo sa Jerusalem at marami na naman nagalit sa kanya gusto na naman siyang patayin. Kaya itinakas na naman siya, pinapunta siya sa Tarsus, yung kanyang hometown. Ngayon, matapos na naglumalago na naglumalago yung church, itong si Barnabas, pinasundo si Saul para makasama niya sa gawain. He was exiled and hidden there earlier. But now he was going to be called to active duty. Verse 26, He found Saul and brought him to Antioch where they met with the church for a whole year and taught many of its people. There in Antioch, the Lord's followers were first called Christians. So natagpuan si Pablo, pinapunta sa Antioch, at isinama ni Barnabas sa pagtuturo sa mga tao doon at lumago ng lumago ang church at doon unang tinawag ang mga nananalig kay Jesus na Christians. Here Barnabas recruits and reactivates Saul and Christians, meaning believers in the resurrected Jesus as the Son of God, the Messiah of Israel and the world, the King of Israel, the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. That's what it meant to be a Christian. Pag sinabing Christian ka, naniniwala ka na si Jesus, ang Christ, ang Kristos, ang Messiah, na siya ang kabuuan ng lahat ng ipinangako nung araw sa mga propeta sa Old Testament, na siya ang anak ng Diyos na nagkatawang tao, na matay, na buhay na muli at bumalik sa langit, at babalik muli bilang mag sa buong Sang sinukob, pag sinabi mo yon, ikaw yung Christian, it was a label. It differentiated you from all others who did not believe. You could die for being called a Christian, you could be persecuted, but people nevertheless thank God that they could be called Christians. Napakalaking pananagutan mga kapatid na matawag ng Christian at napakalaking pribilehyo. 
So huwag nating sirain yung image ng Christian na tuloy yung iba pag nalamang Christian ka, ayaw ka imbitahin sa mga handaan, sa mga kasalan, kasi judgmental ka, wala kang ginawa kundi mamintas, wala kang ginawa kundi manira ng manira ng ibang relihiyon Hindi yun ang unang ibig sabihin ng word na Christian. Naniniwala ka kay Kristo at dahil doon sinusunod mo ang kanyang halimbawa. Acts 11, 27-30 During this time, some prophets from Jerusalem came to Antioch. One of them was Agabus. Then with the help of the Spirit, he told that there would be a terrible famine everywhere in the world. And it happened when Claudius was emperor. The followers in Antioch decided to send whatever help they could send to the followers in Judea. So they had Barnabas and Saul take their gifts to the church leaders in Jerusalem. So, merong nagprophesy na magkakaroon ng salot, magkakaroon ng tagbutom, Ang mga tao naman sa Antioch, di ba? Sinabi na nga natin, it was a very rich commercial city. Most of the believers there were merchants, traders, business people. They had money. So what did they do? They collected money and had them sent to the leaders in Jerusalem by Barnabas and Saul. Take note, Barnabas and Saul were not the leaders in Jerusalem. Sila ay napag-utusan na dalin yung mga funds na ito to the leaders in Jerusalem. At that point, it was Peter, James, and the other original apostles. But the big story here is tulungan. Gentile Christians now helping Jewish Christians. How did that happen? Because the Jewish Christians sent missions to the Gentiles. Now that the Jewish Christians are in trouble, it is the Gentile Christians that will send them help. Iba pag nag may mission ka. Iba pag nagtatanim ka, iba pag gumagawa ka ng tama, pagdating ng panahon, lalo't sa kailangang panahon, may ani na bumabalik sa'yo. Mahalaga na nagmimisyon. Kung minsan, nakikita lang ng mga ibang mga tao, napaka-prospero sa man ng church na ito. Hindi nila alam, ang hirap bago nagmisyon, bago dumami, bago nagkaroon ng mga helpers and mga supporters, ay ang mga dugo at pawis at pagod ng lahat. Kung isa nakikita lang nila yung present day comfort, they don't see all the groundwork and all the sacrifices that happened in the beginning of the history of any church. So church growth was brought about by telling of people about Jesus, by learning and teaching, by spirit-led leadership, and by obeying the Holy Spirit. Even if it means opening up to new, relevant revelation, guidance, and fine-tuning, that probably dictate or demand departure from tradition. Traditions should be upheld as long as they are effective and helpful. But when you're already laboring needlessly just to obey tradition, it's time to let tradition go. Sabi ni Jesus, Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. Ganon din ang tradisyon. Ang mga tradisyon ay nandiyan para dumali, nagkaroon ng ritual, nagkaroon ng step one, two, three, how to do things, para dumali. Pero pag naiwanan na ng panahon ang tradisyon at hindi na ito nagpapadali sa buhay, kundi nagpapahirap pa nga, it's time to say goodbye to tradition and begin new systems and new ways of life. How to be grounded on tradition and scripture and be open to the guidance of the Holy Spirit? It takes a lot of prayer. And it takes a lot of faith in spirit-filled people like Peter who receive revelations. Hindi naman lahat ng revelation na binigay kay Peter na, na bigay sa lahat. Pero nagtiwala sila kay Pedro na yung talagang vision ay naigaling sa Diyos at tinanggap nila at nakita naman nila yung bunga. So hindi ka naman tanggap lang ng tanggap, titingnan mo rin yung bunga. Effective ba? Mabunga nga ba? Maganda nga ba? It is very important. Ang mga Israelites, meron silang culture, may tradition, may scriptures. Pero dumating ang panahon na kinailangan nilang ang iba doon ay isa-isang tabi dahil may mga bago at napapanahong mga katuroan na mas makakatulong sa kanila. At yun ang ginawa ng mga Christians. Tayo ngayon, mga kapatid, do not kill or die for a culture, time, and context-specific verses. Pagka-context-specific, Ang mga verses, you know, alam natin na hindi yun. Dapat na. Dahilan para tayo pumatay o mamatay. Halimbawa, culture-specific verse, women should wear veil in churches. 
Ano yung culture? Culture ng mga Corinthians. Ano yung place? Corinth. Ano yung panahon? No, the first 100 years after Christ. Ano yung context? Prostitutes did not wear veils. Decent women wore veils. Ngayon, former prostitutes became Christians and they were going to church without the veil. So what are people thinking? That they are still prostitutes. So Paul says, women, you should veil in church. Oh, ngayon, 2012, nabasa mo yun. Ay, sabi pala ni Paul, kailangan nagbebelo ang mga babae sa church. Therefore, magbebelo tayong lahat. Tanong, ikaw ba'y taga-Corinth? Yung culture ba sa Corinth, culture dito, dito ba sa Maynila, dito ba sa Pilipinas, pag ang babae ba, hindi nakabelo, prostitute ang ibig sabihin. Hindi. Taga-Corinth ka ba? Hindi. Ikaw ba yung original recipient ng letter? Hindi. Eh bakit ngayon magpapakamatay ka para sa din yan? O bakit papatayin mo yung iba na ayaw sumunod? Eh culture specific yung command. So titingnan mo muna, bago ka sumunod, bago ka magalit sa iba, bago ipagpilitan, o mga babae should wear long hair. Talaga, biblical. No argument. Verse talaga. Pero sino yung kausap? Again, the women of Corinth. Because the prostitute in Corinth wore long hair. Very long hair without the veil. Very, or short hair rather. Without the veil. Bakit? Ang daming marino sa Corinth. Kasi peer yan eh. Therefore, maraming prostitutes. Yung mga marino, dalawa, tatlong araw lang yung bakasyon nila mula sa barko. Sakay na naman, pupunta sa laot. Ikaw naman si baba, eh prostitute ka, kailangan mo ng kliyente. Kailangan mo maghinhinhinhinan ka pa dyan, paligaw ka pa, isang linggo na, hindi ka pa umuoo. Di, walang business. So what do the women do? The prostitutes cut their hair and don't wear veils. Whenever they walk, they are, prost they are actually advertising, I'm available. Ngayon, marami ng mga ganong women, naging kristyano, ganun pa rin ang kustumbre nila, samantalang yung mga conservative Christians and women, naka-veil, mahaba ang buhok. So sabi ni Paul, pahabain yung buhok nyo, nakakahiya ang mga babaeng short hair. Bakit nakakahiya? Kasi prostitute. Pero kung short hair ka ngayon, hindi ka naman prostitute, hindi, hindi nakakaya na short hair ka. Naging issue na ngayon yung hikaw, buho, kung ano-ano ng issue, mga people kill or die for verses na culture specific. In other words, specific yan sa culture na yon. Kung bagay sa yung ngayon, tsaka mo palang i-apply. Kailangan ng tao nag-aaral para hindi ka alipin ng relihiyon kundi palayain ka ng isang bukas na kaisipan at matalinong pananampalataya. So, learn from the first century Christians. The great lesson they learned was to say goodbye even to cherished traditions if it meant adjusting to the new realities to be able to share Christ with people. Paano mga new realities? Paano ka mag adjust sa changing times? Marami mga tao, pagka na-born again, pag nakapag-Bible study, ayaw nang pumunta sa sementeryo pang November 1 dahil wala daw sa Bible yon, bla bla bla. Pero nandun yung mga kamag-anak, no? doon mo masisharean. Nakaupo sila at tagal-tagal, may oras. So what will you do? Use the context of the time for the furtherance of the gospel. Be there and share God. Share the gospel. Anong napalamong na kay, hindi ka humiwalay at na humiwalay ka at hindi ka nakihalobilo? May nawin ka ba for the Lord? Pero ang dami-daming mga Bible-based Christians, ang arte ni ayaw umatin sa mga lamay, sa mga kasalan ng mga kamag-anak, dahil sobra na mga mahigpit sa sarili, nakikihiwalay. Samantalang yung paghihiwalay na nga na yan, itinuro na ni Lord kay Peter noon pa, sa niya, makihalubilo ka para maituro mo ang ako. Tapos tayo ngayon, di ka makikihalubilo dahil be separate from them. Be separate from sinners in the actual committing of their sinful activities. But it doesn't mean that you're physically separate from people. Because how can you be salt when you're separated? Salt has to mix with the decaying or with the walang lasa para magkaroon ng lasa yon. Careful in applying verses. Pag ang pagbabasa, pag interpret at pag apply ng verse ay naggagapos, nagtatali, nagpapasikip ng hininga, nagpapaliit ng mundo, it is probably a wrong reading. Why? Because the ministry of Jesus is to set free. Sabi niya, truth sets free. The ministry of Jesus is to give rest. Sabi niya, come to me all of you who are tired and heavy laden, I'll give you rest. So yung bag-interpretation mo sa scripture, restful? Restful ba? Yun yung buhok mo hanggang lupa? Ang gasto sa shampoo, Ang hirap ubusin ang mga kuto at mahirap i-maintain. Restful ba na pag-usapan ba natin kung gaano kahaba ang damit? Dapat magpapalda ba ang babae o hindi? 
uusikin mo lahat ng babaeng nakapantalon. Restful ba yun? That we all become judges? Nakakita ka lang ng isang nakapantalon. Uh, Masama na agad ang tingin mo, ay, evil woman, nakapants. Do you think that is the issue of Jesus? And this is the major lesson we can learn from this chapter in Acts. That you adjust your actions, your traditions, your behavior, so that you could be kind, so that you could win souls, so that you could further the kingdom of Jesus among men. Ama namin, turuan niyo po kami ng mga practical na lesson para ang mga naganap noon, kapulutan namin ang aral. Patuloy tayong magbulay-bulay sa mandali kung ano ang kahulugan ng pinag-aralan natin ngayon sa inyo inyong buhay and how to make the most of it in telling people about Jesus in the most loving way. Dear Lord, continue to teach us as we lay silent before you asking you to continue to whisper lessons into our ears. Be alone with the Lord for a short while.